Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 12th of June 2023. I'm joined this week not only by my co-host, Mr. Andy Brockman, uh, but also by uh, Mr. Giles Richardson of an organisation called MAST, or MAST, depending on what part of the country you're from. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, organisation to be uh, talking to, in uh, particular because we're uh, examining a story that we started covering on a previ previous recent episode of Watching Brief with regards to HMS Prince of Wales and also HMS Repulse and uh, some of the issues that have arisen around looting or at the very least, I suppose, uh, material recovery on those wreck sites. And, um, well, Giles, if you could possibly just introduce yourself and uh, what on earth MAST is, then people might have an understanding as to why there are three beardy type people on their screen today. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for <laughs> pleasure, pleasure to be to be here. I'm not quite sure if you know what you let yourself in for, uh, but here goes. So, my name is Charles Richardson. I am senior archaeologist at the Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, or MAST for short, and we are one of the UK's leading maritime archaeology charities. Mm. And we're a small charity that tries to do everything. So, we run your traditional underwater archaeology projects. Um, but we also maintain a large conservation lab um, down in Poole on the south coast where we take in and conserve material from lots of different sites. Um, we're also an advocacy organisation, so you'll often hear us uh, twisting the government's arm when it comes to protecting our very badly neglected heritage at sea, mm -hmm. uh, partnering with other great organisations out there. Mm -hmm. And the other hat I'm wearing today is uh, an initiative that we are doing in conjunction with another charity uh, called um, Ocean Mind. And under the umbrella of Maritime Observatory, uh, which is our brand name, uh, we run a um, space-based observation program aimed at protecting shipwrecks at sea from um, what we call IUU um, activity. That's illegal, unauthorized, um, unregulated as, as a way of getting around um, whether we call it salvage, looting, recovery. I see, I see. And presumably, uh, because you don't necessarily go into material recovery in the name, could it also be unauthorised, uh, just access to a site as well? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, I can talk to you later about some yeah. methodologies and kind of things we look for. But yes, any activity at all over a site, whether mm. intentional or unintentional. Okay, okay. Well, uh, as I've just said, we've, we've recently covered this story, at least started to cover this story on Watching Brief. But uh, given that, that you can go back and, and look at that for background, I suppose, just briefly, Andy, could you possibly just fill us in on, uh, I suppose, on the, the history of these wrecks and why this sort of um, this sort of conversation is necessary around the monitoring of these sites? Right. The, the immediate prompt for both of us being here, actually, uh, on this show in particular, I, I'm wearing a different hat today. I'm wearing my pipeline hat and... My you, 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 you both keep hat. talking about hats. I can't see any hats. It's a metaphoric. It's, oh. yeah, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's that, oh. that metaphorical archaeological hat. Okay. Uh, okay. If, if you like, I'm I, I'm riding two horses today. I'm a, I'm I'm a presenter on Watching Brief, and I'm also a, a the editor of Pipeline and a writer and researcher, and, and particularly interested in uh, maritime heritage crime, basically. So does that mean that that Charles um, is riding two horses or just one? I'm probably riding two boats or one. Maybe two dolphins. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go on, Andy. Go on. <laughs> no, look. Uh, cut to the chase. Now, the, the, um, the reason I, I'm, I'm sat here riding my metaphorical two seahorses um, is that um, Jazz and I just uh, co-authored a basically a long read background piece about what has happened to the wrecks of HMS Prince of Wales, which is a world, um, battleship that was commissioned in 1941, mm. and uh, another Royal Navy warship, the battle cruiser HMS Repulse. They were both sunk on December the 10th, 1941, in action about 50 miles off the coast of Malaya by the Japanese Air Force. Um, they went down with the loss of between the uh, 840 Royal Navy officers and crew. And... Um, they have been a bone of contention, as we explain in the piece, um, for at least the last 50 years. Mm. Um, it's been an issue in government that these wrecks are far away in the, in, in, you know, in, in offshore waters, difficult to monitor, but vulnerable to, um, 
first of all, really uh, free diving. The, um, when when modern diving equipment became available, the wrecks became increasingly accessible, and um, it was realised that um, divers were visiting the wrecks, even entering the wrecks and souveniring. Mm. Now, again, we can talk about the legal background later, but that was found to be offensive by uh, many people, including survivors groups and, mm. and, and families and so on. So there was a protection issue raised it from that point of view, but also really certainly from the early to mid 1970s in terms of the potential for commercial salvage of the wrecks in an area that, as Giles pointed out, you know, it, it, it sort of, um, well, it is regulated, but the regulation is loosely applied because it is so remote. Mm. And um, so what we've now done and thanks to the work that Mast have done with ocean mind as the maritime observatory is to really supply the evidence to back up what people have suspected for a long time which is that these wrecks are being pillaged by commercial salvages yeah unregulated commercial salvage mm. um and giles will explain how that's been done and what happened but basically um this is a response uh to reports in a very 21st century way or in very 2023 mm -hmm. way um, re a response to evidence that first emerged on social media in Malaysia that was then picked up uh, in the English-speaking social media and led to the investigation that we're, uh, that we're Giles in particular is going to describe in a minute. Yeah. Well, uh, Giles, in that sense, the uh, I made a note here when Andy and I were doing some prep um, and uh, my, my note said something along the lines of uh, this story appears to be about the balance between government responsibility and uh, meeting the real world. And uh, that, that goes both ways. So, for example, the real world may well be that distance and cost is a factor that gets in the way of the government, uh, the MOD or, and others, um, fulfilling a duty of care that they may well say they want to fulfill. Um, but at the same time, it sounds as though you're providing... Uh, or you can provide sort of monitoring using so-called space archaeology uh, that we've we've probably heard elsewhere, uh, or some of our viewers probably have heard about elsewhere, particularly, for example, in the context of the work of people like Sarah Parkak. Um, so, in that sense, how uh, how much of a hurdle is you know, the are these real world concerns, particularly? Oh, it's very far away in terms of our ability to to adequately. Um, just at the very least have a s sense of what's happening on a site uh, in in a body of water on the other side of the world. It's a good point, Mark. Um, mm. I guess the issue we have with um, any underwater wreck, um, submerged settlement, any, any site um, you care to mention, if it's out of sight of land mm. and it's not sitting within a country's territorial waters or it's sitting in an area um, where locally it may not have the same importance that it does to the culture that produced it, the culture that lost it. Um, it becomes very tricky and there's lots of different stakeholders involved and there's lots of different layers of um, legislation that may protect or may not protect it. Mm. Um, in the case of these vessels, they sit just on that boundary between uh, recreational diving depths and more technical diving depths, which means that um, you can easily reach it as a diver. Um, it sits in a very accessible area if you have the right technology and know-how as a salver, so mm -hmm. you, it has the potential to be accessed and it's not protected in the way that some of the very deep wrecks from the Battle of the Atlantic or the middle of the Mediterranean are. Mm. Um, and as technology's progressed, uh, these sites have gone from being out of sight, out of mind to being uh, much more vulnerable. Uh, because it doesn't sit in Malaysian waters, um, it sits in their, in their um, exclusive economic zone, which should mm. give it some legal protections, um, it's vulnerable to put to salvers um, acting in an unauthorized, unlegal way, coming in and effectively stealing it. Uh, but, it's, but it's outside that envelope of protection that um, sitting in territorial waters would give it. Um, and it's a very long way from, way from the UK. I think it would be a different situation if it was sitting um, close into the UK. But I know, as you guys have covered um, very well in the past, it's sitting in the middle of the North Sea doesn't necessarily give a shipwreck um, from race in the period any more protection. Mm. Uh, it's always just that out of sight, which makes monitoring a bit more tricky. Yeah. We sometimes talk about it, imagine you've got a nice suit of armour sitting in a, a castle mm. in the middle of a farmer's field. If it's an English heritage property, it's managed, um, you can look after it. But if the door's open and um, anyone can come come in, it's it's just it's very tempting. Yeah. 
Can I just interject quickly as well? Because th there is a, an issue that there's a lot of misconceptions about, which I just like to sort of put on the table uh, again, and w which we do in the piece. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a lot of the media coverage of this. And there has been quite a bit of media coverage since Mars broke the story in, in the English language, uh, certainly. Um, uh, so, and certainly in the UK. Um, but, uh, and that is over the idea of a war grave. Hmm. A lot of people think that these are military vessels. They are war graves in the same way that a Commonwealth war graves um, cemetery would be in France or Germany or Britain or even a foreign jurisdiction like uh, the ones I visited when we were working in Burma. Um, and that isn't the case at sea. Mm. Uh, international law at sea and even many um, local jurisdictions don't allow for the concept of legal protection for a military vessel, even if it was lost with heavy loss of life. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, which is why when you read statements, for example, from the British Ministry of Defence about this issue, they don't talk about war graves. They talk about, some times they'll hedge it around by saying that you know, people think of them as war graves or regard as war graves or, or, or accepted as war graves. That has no legal standing. No. What no. they talk about instead is a maritime military grave. Mm -hmm. which is basically saying, yep, we recognise this as the resting place or memorial at least to the people who lost their lives when that ship sank. Uh, but that, that in, in, in terms of legal protection, that is a, a, a statement of optimism rather than of legal reality. It's not enforceable. Well, having said that, and uh, I want to return to Giles just to talk a little bit about uh, the satellite methodology in just a moment, but... What, therefore, just as you know, seeing as you have brought this up, what separates a site like this in terms of its importance um, from being uh, important due to a sort of form of nostalgia versus a, 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 you know legal claims and ownership? In so much as uh, are they important to us because I think, as Charles hinted, they were produced by our society, our military, and they contain uh, members of the of the Royal Navy when they went down. Or are they also important because they have a, a real um, uh, ongoing connection to the state? Uh, where, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about owning intrinsic material value, but rather are they actually still attached to the country in that sense, or to the to the to the MOD or to the Navy? Well, the the, the Navy certainly regard them as their ships. Mm. Um, that, that there is a concept that once a ship is lost on active service, it remains the property of the flag state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that does bring some complicated legal issues into play and um which we go into a bit again in in, in the piece and we've been working very closely with a, a colleague professor mark williams from plymouth university who's one of our leading maritime lawyers mm. um and uh, you know uh, good luck to him and anybody who tries to uh, work in this field it is a it, it's a real headache mm. um because you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions plus international uh, legal responsibilities. I mean, the, the thing I would say is that, you know, yeah, um, you know, legally under the UN Salvage Convention, it remains the property of the flag state. Um, morally and emotionally, it remains um, an important part of the lives of the people who, it, it, sadly, very few left who actually served on those ships and mm. survived. But certainly the families of people who served on those ships, and, he, and particularly the families of people who were lost on those ships, mm. it's a very live emotional issue. Mm. I mean, we, we, we found when we looked at the issue of uh, ships lost in World War One that you know, three generations on, people still remember people who were lost and mm. care about them as members of their families. Mm. You know, but this, these issues of remembrance and uh, memorialization are really live and really important. I think, as you know, archaeologists and historians, we have to be we have to respect that. And then the final thing is these are archaeological sites. Yes. And if you look at those wrecks forensically before they're, uh, it, without their being destroyed by unregulated salvage, mm -hmm. uh, for example, historically, the loss of Prince of Wales and Repulse is seen by many maritime historians as effectively the, the death of the big gun battleship, mm. that those vessels could not be sustained in an environment where they didn't have permanent air cover. Mm -hmm. They were just too vulnerable. And within two or three years the battleship has been reduced to basically trolling along to bombard the next island and the strike element of navy of navies of that period has become the aircraft carrier battle group 
yeah which we are now seeing expressed again on trips to the far east by um hms queen elizabeth recently and ironically her uh, sistership is hms prince of wales oh. so you know th there are many many layers within this but you know uh, uh, the, the human angle and the archaeological angle do come together on this in a very live way i think well and, and i should say i should just to be clear when i when i say nostalgia i'm talking from the perspective of how a government or a state may may approach the idea of a sunken ship i.e is it is it to do with national identity or is it to do with actually a, you know a claim on on the physicality of the wreck uh, i'm not not undermining uh the, the 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 ethical and moral issues there um but in terms of uh, forensic uh, monitoring and, and awareness, uh, how how uh, how uh, how do we know that stuff has happened on site? I suppose this is a question for you, Giles. Um, and also, how uh, how forensic can you be? How precise? How exacting is it? Is it possible to be with uh, with this sort of monitoring, presumably from a great distance away? Absolutely, Mark. Well. <laughs> I suppose my answer now is a little bit different from what we've been a few years ago. With the uh, war in Ukraine, we've seen a huge growth in uh, what we call sort of citizen OSINT analysis. Mm. Um, so people sitting at the computer at home, um, able to access a huge body of research and, um, and information and data available from all sorts of different sources and provide a really interesting intelligence picture. We're doing something very similar um, but applying it to ships and, uh, and, and applying it particularly to underwater heritage um, in a way that people haven't done before. But we're using the same technology and the same techniques. Um, I we talk about three main sources of information. Um, the first one, which was a real game changer when it was brought in about um, 15, 20 years ago, is what we call AIS, which is Automatic Identification System. Mm -hmm. Effectively, it's a transmitter beacon that all large ships are supposed to carry, and it signs a safety fe feature. It pings your location so other vessels know where you are, and it's meant to avoid collisions at sea. And if a, ve if a vessel suddenly stops pinging, it's meant to be help you instantly in um, in, in finding and rendering assistance. Mm. Um, the flip side of that is it also means other people know where you are, so your movements can be tracked and they're not secret anymore. Mm. Um, and um, as you may have covered before with, with Andy looking at some of the, some of the other sites, um, salvers tend to transmit on AIS if they're in larger vessels, and they have developed all sorts of sophisticated and clever ways of um, manipulating that data to try and stay hidden. Uh, my favorite is, is still... Um, a technique explained to me by a guy in North Sea to put a bucket over the top of the transmitter. Um, <laughs> it will still ping. It will still ping uh -huh. a strong enough signal that a, a fisheries protection vessel a mile away will think that you're transmitting normally, but satellites aren't going to pick up the signal from space or from land, la land stations. So there's a good chance that information won't be preserved. So right. you're, you're effectively ghosting through the water. Mm. Um, we don't, need, don't yet know everything that's happened with this particular salvage barge. Um, Chang Hong uh, 68. Again, excuse all my pronunciations when it comes to this region. I am uh, a true Anglophile. I, I don't speak Malaysian or, or Chinese, unfortunately, yet. Um, in this case, the AIS signal seems to have been um, simply turned off when the vessel was out of sight of um, shore so that she could go and work unnoticed on a variety of sites in the area, both east and west. Um, but she transmitted freely when she was operating in harbours and in waterways where she might be subject to inspection. Right. And one of the reasons we think she did that was Malaysia um, was one of the first countries in the world to really tighten its law on AIS um, last, uh, sorry, 2021, which made it a legal requirement for larger vessels to be permanent transmitting. Um, whereas previously, um, again, excuse me for jumping around all sorts of different subjects, mm. when we saw the first round of salvage attacks um, from around 2012, 2017, the early days of AIS, there was actually very little um, transmissions given off from these barges and when they were, they were frequently um, either turned off or they were manipulated in some way to show false positions, false identities. So they really was very little information. Right. Okay. So that's AIS, which is the um, effectively data generated by the, the target vessel you're looking at itself. Mm -hmm. The other technology we bring in, which is where we talk about space, space based, we're taking imagery from satellites that already exist commercially for other purposes. Uh, the one we're all familiar with is electro optical, which is very similar to a photograph. And these are the images that you're used to seeing, um, whether it's images of the Ukraine war or photographs of ships, particularly in harbor, we've got nice views. And if you want any sort of CIA spy film where someone's trying to read a newspaper um, from an imagery, that's the kind of technology we're talking about here. Um, it has limitations. My biggest enemy. You're, you're, you're actually saying you're, you're, you're the Tom Clancy of maritime archaeology, aren't you? <laughs> I would love to be that. Although I fear I'm the, um, I see Jack Ryan, he's the, uh, the 
the yes, analyst. The yeah. analyst. I'm, I'm more Jack Ryan locked mm. in the um, in the computer room um, than the yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, John, the John Krasinski. Stuff. John Krasinski. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah. So. Uh, uh, just, just. I know you were just about to go on to say something else, but just on that topic of uh, resolution, I mean, is, is presumably that's not a realistic resolution. Are we talking? Is it like a meter per pixel, perhaps? It's a very much pay for play, and right. one of the advantages we have as the observatory is we're able to buy in large amounts of data from commercial providers relatively cheaply compared to um, what the public could do. So we can. Um, access some of the more expensive satellites. The resolutions we tend to work with, I really like, are 20 um, centimeters per pixel or 30 centimeters per pixel. Excellent. Definitely not enough to read a newspaper, maybe just about big enough to see that the, new, the newspaper is, is a pixel. Mm -hmm. Very good for identifying larger vessels. Um, but again, when we're dealing with smaller vessels that may only be 20 or 30 meters long, they're very small. Right. Uh, most of the free imagery that you can access, fantastic systems like Copernicus, one, I still think one of the greatest EU initiatives where they have satellites orbiting the Earth constantly, taking images of every pole in the Earth every couple of days, and it's all available for free um, to anyone who wants it. That's um, much less resolution, typically um, 10 meters to a pixel. Okay. Um, partially just the age, of the, the age and the cost of the system. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure the military have much better systems, and they may well even be uh, reading our newspapers right now. We'll probably never know. Uh, well, jokes on them. I, uh, I, I don't buy newspapers. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so that's the technology. Uh, what in this case has it been able to reveal about, uh, well, HMS Prince of Wales? Mm -hmm. Uh, what it's shown us is we've, we've been able to verify um, how much activity has been over the site in the past 12 months. Mm. And that was the first thing we found really shocking. If we're living in this modern age, social media gave people the awareness that something had happened. There's, uh, there's two things that happened um, in, a, in a few weeks of each other. The first one was um, some fishermen who went out to Prince of Wales site to fish over it. Mm -hmm. because shipwrecks are also fantastic coral reefs that allow far greater diversity of species than they would in the North Sea, so fishermen are always drawn to them. Yeah. And that's a, a great symbiosis of archaeology. Um, they went to fish and they were surprised to find a large salvage barge sitting over the site. And they claimed they were chased away by a smaller vessel, uh, by some very aggressive um, guards who said, you're not allowed to be here, we're working. Right. Um, that got filtered through various sources back to the Malaysian authorities at about the same time that the owner of a small scrapyard tucked away in the corner of a creek near Singapore posted a very ill-advised TikTok celebrating a large British naval gun being unloaded by a very large crane barge onto his, um, onto his yard, which um, alerted a lot of local activists, people interested in history, that something was very wrong, mm. and that triggered a whole cascade of events. Uh, but all that gave us really was that something had happened, and it happened in late April, early May. Um, we were able to draw up the AS, AS track from this vessel that showed it had been operating in the area for two years. But all it really showed us was it was coming in out of harbour and then disappearing. Mm. Um, using the satellite imagery, uh, because we know where Prince of Wales is, and we have some um, fairly regular passes of um, satellites every two days, I was able to take a snapshot and say, is there any activity happening on the site? I started in May and went, okay, yes, there's a, there is a vessel that looks like 100 metres long sitting over the site. Um, so I went back to April. Yes, it's still there. This is deeply concerning. It's still there in March. Wow. Still there in February, all the way back to December. It was only in um, just a Christmas day that we had the first image that didn't show a vessel over the site. Wow. And that's what really shocked us, that this, this vessel was able to operate for five months, less undetected. Um, and I think that I, I'd like to interject there mm -hmm. very briefly, if I may, Mark. Um, to, to put this in perspective, for, again, nearly 50 years, the British government has been saying that it will liaise with the Malaysian mm. authorities uh, to observe, monitor and protect Prince of Wales and Repulse. Um, and what Giles has just described is really a failure of intelligence. Well, um, and that. one has to ask, and maybe we can explore this later in the conversation, but one has to ask how serious that involvement, that uh, that sharing, that monitoring has actually been in that over that period of time. Okay. I'll no, jump in at this point and say in 2019, we actually monitored the Prince of Wales for a year as just part of our, our pilot um, project to see what technology could do. And we were able to detect the Royal Navy surveys that happened um, just checking on the, on the condition of the wreck. Um, so we already knew we could do this. The problem was no one was paying us to do it. Yeah. 
A watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst, and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. So you say uh, people need to pay for these sorts of services if, if they want them to be effective and ongoing. I suppose that that leads to two inevitable questions initially from me, certainly. And that is, first of all, um, how did you do this without uh, funding in that sense? You know, you, you were alerted and and we now know uh, without having been, for example, funded by the UK government necessarily. Um, but also which... Uh, which governments, or may, or perhaps it's more delicate to ask, what does funding from a large institution like a government or a, 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 some other interested party uh, look like, uh, particularly in, in comparison to the, the coverage that you've already described uh, in and around the uh, HMS Prince of Wales? Good questions. Um, I'll start with the Prince of Wales um, and how we, how we funded that. Mm. Um, Effectively, we're, we were able to use um, the subscriptions that we already have um, in place from other clients because often we're buying uh, bulk data, whether it's AIS data mm. um, or, or satellite imagery uh, through our partnership with Ocean Mind. Uh, we were able just to refocus that onto the Prince of Wales uh, where we had some, we had some um, excess capacity. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned before, we had monitored Prince of Wales in the past, which meant that we already knew what we were doing. It was a very quick process just to zoom in on the site and um, and also just look at the um, the vessels, um, vessel of interest, the, uh, the prior candidates that we knew about already. Mm. Um, it just It's interesting that it was Chang Hong 68. It could easily have been um, another vessel we'd never seen before. Mm. Um, and in terms of how we, how we do this, it doesn't have to be a big government that pays for this. Um, mm. We've had, we're very lucky uh, this year to get um, funding from the Honor Frost Foundation, which is a maritime archaeology uh, fund, um, it's currently administered, um, um, by the Honor Frost Foundation um, from, a, from a grant from, from, the, from Honor Frost, who was a great archaeologist. Mm -hmm. um, it's focused on the Eastern Mediterranean, and they paid us to do a year's worth of monitoring on the Egadi Island site, uh, which is the last uh, naval battle of the Punic War in 241 BC. It's mm -hmm. the only site um, anywhere in the world where naval battles have taken place, where you can see the archaeological evidence on the seabed. And what we what they found so far is we know about 80 Roman and Carthaginian ships were lost in the battle. Uh, 24 of them have now been found um, over the last few years. And um, the most iconic object from these are these enormous um, bronze rams mm. on the seabed. Uh, the site is a national park in, in um, Sicilian waters, um, but it suffer, suffers from um, illicit fishing, uh, dragging nets across the site. And as always concerned, these objects are eminently steer, stealable and the potential is still 50 out there to be found. There's always concerns divers may go looking for them. So we use that money to um, give the uh, Cameroni situational awareness, show them what the pattern of life looks like, how much activity there is, um, what sort of vessels are entering, entering the area. Um, and it wasn't a very large amount of money. Um, so we can do this kind of, sort of tight focus studies on small sites, or we can do um, with more money, lot, lot much bigger, more comprehensive studies. So in that sense, isn't, you're not necessarily... Oh, can I just you're not necessarily looking to uh to fund uh, or one wouldn't be looking to fund say the launch of a bespoke information gathering platform like a satellite rather it's funding access to data that that's already being generated it's exactly it as archaeologists we're amazing at borrowing um, other people's technology mm. and we're just um doing that in the uh, doing that with, with imagery and data and just applying it um to an archaeological su subject no one else has done that before mm -hmm. the technology already exists we went to ocean mind as a partner because they were already doing this looking into legal fishing and have been for several years so they were really good at um knowing what sort of patterns to look for and they developed an ai system as well which helps them um sift through literal mountains of data and find the unusual activity and we've just tweaked that a bit with our knowledge of what, what a salvage vessel looks like, what a diving vessel looks like, what an archaeological vessel looks like. Okay. Andy, are you can I just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say just to, um, a, a little bit of the backstory, really. Um, the, um, 
Giles talked about OSINT earlier on. In, in case people weren't familiar with the term or aren't familiar with the term, it's open source intelligence. Mm. And um, it's basically anything that's out there that can be pulled in to help tell the story. Mm -hmm. And um, basically what we what we've been using what you know the investigations i've been involved with previously like for example on hms queen mary and uh, hms victory 1744 and things like that um it, it, it's pulling in all sorts of different data from the another acronym human human intelligence sources that talk to you mm -hmm. through social media through press reports um, th through to the more sort of exciting secret squirrel seeming stuff like Giles is talking about today, you know, satellites going overhead with high resolution cameras. And, and, and actually, I think also um, Giles didn't mention, but also satellites uh, that use radar that can see through cloud. Hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, there, there are other other sources of, of, of information out there. And it is a case of just bringing them all together to help tell the story um, and um, and highlight the issues. The other thing I'd, I'd like to highlight, and again, Giles has just sort of touched on it, is this is one of those instances where um, we talk about the environment and the historic environment. In fact, there is just one environment. Hmm. And here, research into illegal fishing and issues around climate change and things like that has become directly relevant to managing the historic environment. And I think that's, you know, to, to break down those silos and see the interoperability of all these, these sources is actually really very useful and helpful for us. Well, and and maybe this is something that Giles doesn't necessarily want to directly comment on. So I, so I might let Andy uh, do the dirty work here. Um, but, uh, I know that Andy has talked in the, I think in our previous episode on this topic about how, for example, uh, the Dutch have uh, been able to fund monitoring of equivalent wrecks in similar parts of the world, uh, Second World War battleships, this kind of thing, uh, using cultural funding. So it's not necessarily even coming from, my understanding at least, is not necessarily coming from uh, their equi the equivalent of a Ministry of Defence. Um, are we talking here about a matter of priorities being demonstrated, i.e. not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk when it comes to actually monitoring these sites? Because my understanding also is that, uh, was it, was it, uh, uh, I might be wrong, was it, oh no, it was, um, uh, oh, Mr. Shut Up and Go Away. Gavin Williamson. Gavin Williamson, yes, he was talking about doing. He of the tarantula. Yes, yes doing, and a whip, I think. Uh, doing a survey yes. uh, or uh, or keeping uh, keeping the house the House of Parliament up to speed on a survey that was going to un be undertaken on on the Prince of Wales in particular. Um, now that's talking the talk, but in that sense, again, it's just a matter of will and and allocation as to whether or not people can actually walk the walk on on looking after these these sites that are of uh, you know important uh, national st for national stories for personal stories and also just for uh in that sense sovereign stories as well i'll do a, a, okay. a quick comment and then i, I shall let um i'll hand over to andy for the full bore, bore treatment mm -hmm. um i think in the uk we have the problem that um politicians have always been short-sighted and they're scared of spending money mm. um so we we estimated it would cost somewhere uh, in the region of um, fifteen to thirty thousand pounds to protect um, Prince of Wales and Repulse uh, with regular monitoring, that would have, that would definitely have detected this kind of um, incursion over five months. Absolutely no question. We could have very confidently said we could have alerted them at least in January, if, if not sooner. Yeah. Um, but that's a lot of money to spend, and so they didn't want to spend it. Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, with... I mean, com compared to what? I mean, compared to the average minister's uh, uh, lunch claims in parliament i'm sure it's not that much money but anyway so go ahead go not, not not at all not at no. all i mean compared to MMD, MMD procurement wastage it's it's, yeah. it's, it's a, um, a rounding error yeah. um but when you have to deal with the aftermath and we're now looking at uh one battleship completely ripped open ammunition mm. all over the seabed a 10 kilometer plume of oil um the cleanup costs which are still at the moment legally polluter pay um polluter pays and the polluter being the owner being the ministry of defense mm. um could could easily run into the millions uh, mm. i've had heard the figure 30 million mentioned um that's a very expensive hindsight mistake to make yeah so um it is cheaper to monitor these things mm. um and we wish they would yeah um, over to you andy as well yeah i mean 
I think in, in all of these issues, um, there's a common factor, and that is the British government response, the Ministry of Defence response, is always reactive. Hmm. Something happens, they're told about it, they have a fit of the vapours, throw their hands up in horror, say how terrible it is, and that they'll liaise and monitor, um, and, um, and then we don't hear anything else. Hmm. So they deal with the immediate PR issue, but in terms of preventing it happening again, which is probably the physically and politically cheaper way of dealing with it, they don't look that far ahead. It's like Giles has just said. Um, you know, we, we politicians don't just work in electoral cycles; they work in news cycles. Mm. And this story just happens to have broken at one of the busiest news cycles of the year so far. Um, you think about what's happened since the beginning of May, mm. um, when the story first broke. Mm. Um, at, to, at, and coming through, you know, we're talking about it on the day when the news is dominated by the report into the conduct of Boris Johnson, yeah. and it that and that'll run through until the weekend and next Monday when the uh, they have a vote on it. So, uh, trying to get any kind of traction in the media, let alone in Parliament, when there, there's this level of distraction around, is very very difficult, and 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 that makes the long term strategic decision making influencing and then decision making really difficult too and you know I, 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 at one level i've got a certain amount of sympathy with you know even ministers the the, the information overload mm -hmm. particularly that somebody like um you know, you know for example ben wallace current defense secretary is dealing with the biggest war in europe since 1945 and the geopolitical consequences of that plus a an ec economic and increasingly military semi cold war in the around the pacific rim with the emergence of a, a blue water navy operated by china mm -hmm. and the geopolitical issues around here given this is a chinese flag vessel are you know significant so you know it's not an easy call and okay you know 30 to 50 grand it's not even a rounding error it's what's left down the ministerial sofa the yeah. back of the ministerial sofa mm. in, in in main building in whitehall mm. But it's it's getting the attention for long enough to the for the government process to kick in and and work. I think I think that you know we we can talk about going forward um, later. But the um, I, I, I think at the moment the the role of operations like Giles has described and the wider archaeological community taking that information on board is to work with expert bodies with organizations like the national museum of the royal navy um to say to the mod and to government look this is a recur recurring problem as we explained in the piece it's been a recurring problem for the last 50 years almost mm -hmm. so why not just put it to bed let the people who know how to deal with it deal with it and you can get on with doing the stuff that geopolitically is actually probably more important like the relationship with china and what's happening in ukraine well it, uh I mean, we, we we we've just heard the possibility of there being a, a big cleanup operation required of uh, an oil and presumably other substances uh, plume coming out of out of the wreck. Um, is that likely to focus minds? Or are we going to have local, uh, you know, interests, stakeholders in terms of fisheries, trade routes, so on and so forth, uh, poking? Uh, Britain in the in the in the shoulder and saying, "Oi, clean this up in the near future." I, I would say first of all um, that the um, everybody is calling for up to date information, accurate information from on the ground. Now, at the moment, uh, we don't know if MOD has talked to the Malaysians about commissioning another survey, mm -hmm. and if so, when it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the environmental stuff, it's already happening. Giles has described a 10 kilometer oil slick. Mm. Um, and certainly um, the in the past, the Ministry of Defence has paid for an oil cleanup. Uh, a Royal Fleet Auxiliary tanker was torpedoed off St. Helena in the South Atlantic in 1941. Mm. And about five years ago, uh, they paid a commercial company to come and empty the fuel bunkers that had started to leak. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, now, the price of that contract hasn't been released, but it won't have been cheap. No. And 
the bean counters in Whitehall will be aware of that. And I would imagine, um, I mean, um, Giles mentioned a figure earlier on uh, about a potential cleanup for Prince of Wales. Uh, that sounds entirely accurate to me. It's, it's an entirely reasonable um, figure. So, you know, um, these are things that are likely to happen. And it's, and it's where I was saying, you know, the, the government has been reactive um, and it's time to maybe get a bit proactive and head off these things. But I mean, Giles, what do you reckon? No, I think I think those are all good good points. Um, I think the key thing with the oil will be um, it's been released. Um, there there is now this ten kilometer stream of oil floating around the shipping lanes about fifty miles offshore. It, the question will be when does it come ashore? How much mm -hmm. damage is it going to do? And when it does come ashore, how attributable will it be to the Prince of Wales? I think will be how much sort of political ramifications that happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there is some people in MOD. I don't have any inside knowledge on this. Who are probably just hoping that it it goes away and. Um, <laughs> I just keep, keep uh, just sticking their head in the sand, covering their eyes. Yeah. Um, so, so go yeah. In, in terms of, sort no. of monitoring that's happened, um, we know that th this thing comes in fits and spurts. The um, initial wave of damage we saw happening um, 10 years ago, around sort of 2012, 2017, we had about 10 salvage barges operating in the Java Sea area. That, that includes the waters of, of Malaysia, um, Singapore, um, Indonesia, um, the other side of Borneo, all the way over to the Philippines. And we know at least 50 wrecks uh, were hit. That caused international outrage, and there were responses. Um, MOD surveyed Prince Wales and Repulse. The Australians and Americans were active on um, slightly later battle sites, the Battle the First and Second Battle of Java Sea, on uh, other large warships like Houston and Perth. And um, the Malaysians particularly were very proactive, and they brought in air, air, air patrols. Um, the, uh, the king... Um, uh, Prince of Wales, as was visited um, Malaysia in 2017, and met some of the divers who were uh, helping to protect the site. And I'm told that that encouraged the Malaysians to operate air patrols over the, um, the site quite regularly, which apparently deterred further activity. I'm told they were stopped during the pandemic as money was routed elsewhere, and they haven't restarted, which may have also been one of the reasons why we had this window less coverage, less interest, suddenly metal prices changed, which we discussed in the article with Andy, uh, which has allowed this window for bad actors to come in. I think that's what we need to be aware of in the future. This thing is going to keep happening mm. if the conditions are right and we allow it. Ab absolutely. And, and part of that um, OSINT that we've talked about, the open source intelligence, is following the metal exchanges. Mm. In the uh, When the... Um, the wrecks in the North Sea were hit most recently. It was roughly around about 2008, 2010. Um, and this is the story we wrote about in 2016. Um, again, working with Mast and other colleagues in the maritime um, environment, as well as people in the salvage, in salvage industry. And that was happening at exactly the same time as the work was beginning in the Java Sea as well. And that was at a time when metal prices were spiking, particularly in the Far East, because of the building boom. And the Chinese economy was going gangbusters. Mm. Um, then there was a, a recession and then came COVID. The metal prices fell back somewhat. Uh, and also the activity became more difficult. Um, and they went off looking for other jobs. Charles describes how, for example, uh, Chuan Hong 68 was spotted in Iran working in the, on uh, apparently working for the Iranian oil industry mm. uh, on projects related to the Iranian oil, oil industry. Mm -hmm. um, so, if she's you know she's a commercial operator, if she's back in those waters around Malaysia, there's a reason. And again, if you look at the metal prices, we're coming out of COVID. The building industries are recovering, and there's a, a, the demand for metal, the 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 the, um, the price of metal on the scrap, even on the scrap metal exchanges, is rising. And that's 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 a red flag in in terms for we need to watch these wrecks again even more closely because there's a live motive for the unauthorized unregulated salvages to go back in well it's interesting actually you mentioned uh the metal salvage and metal prices and so on and so forth something that giles mentioned a little earlier was the uh the the wrecking yard sorry not wrecking yard the scrapyard where material uh, turned up and uh, I believe uh, a, a gun barrel was seen on a TikTok video. Um, now, yeah, we, we've talked about the, the need to understand possibly the impact of on the environment, for example, of oil plumes and oil, oil spillage and um, spills. Uh, but 
presumably the implied damage is catastrophic uh, because the the ship itself, Prince of Wales, is uh, went down keel side up, um, and in order to get to the guns on the top of the ship, which now are presumably were on the seabed or very close to it, you have to go through at the very least, uh, or, or, or at the very least disturb the whole wreck and go round. Um, but with the oil spill, it, it strongly implies lots of broken pipes and, and, and entrance into the machine room, this kind of, in the engine room, this kind of thing. Uh, but all of this presumably can only be speculation. Uh, so, uh, so presumably on, on grounds of environmental assessment, but also um, uh, the damage to the wreck, uh, it is, is step one uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a going forward plan, as it were, uh, at the very least a survey, going there, looking at what's happened, assessing it um both in terms of cost but also in terms of actually the state of the wreck as it as it is today well mark I, I think a survey is desperately needed um i don't think it really matters whether it's done by uh the royal navy or it's done by um the malaysian authorities um whether that's the heritage led or military led mm. uh we're desperately short of information and with the with the um damage done we just need to know what, what's happened mm. um in terms of sort of understanding um, how much damage has been done. Um, we can make some educated guesses based on capabilities of the salvage vessel. So we know it was, um, it made six visits to the site. We know it spent about two weeks um, over the ship um, each time. So we can calculate a certain work rate. Uh, we know it's in an 8,000 ton vessel and um, I believe Andy's calculated it could capable of carrying about 3,000 tons worth of scrap metal. Mm. So um, in the five times it went back to this yard to unload material, we can make the educated guess that each time it probably was carrying around 3,000 tons worth of metal. Mm. Um, Prince of Wales um, has an unlading capacity uh, size tonnage of about 36,000 tons. Um, mm. So unfortunately those numbers start to, start to um, creep up. We, we, we can sort of chip away at the size of what, what may be left yeah. um we have a theory because she's sitting upside down the most lucrative parts of a ship um of water um are the um the high quality metals um so in a battleship you get high quality metal in the propellers in any of the functioning parts of the engine room that includes condensers boilers um the engines themselves um copper piping and the armor belt as well is very high quality steel and very thick steel, which would be very attractive if you're in the in the market for the pure iron. Um, so we are, it's logical to assume um, that they were targeted at the center of the ship. And we can also use as a proxy the objects that we've identified um, either on the, on the um, deck of the salvage barge or on the yard uh, for how, how far they've got. We saw an oil plume which implies they got into the fuel tanks, mm -hmm. which are very logical. The ship's upside down. The fuel tanks were actually used as part of the um, sort of secondary protection for the ship, so they're around the outside. Oh, okay. um, within that, you then get the magazines, where the ammunition that isn't being used immediately is, is being stored, and that's wrapped around the engine room. And we had very large quantities of ammunition um, turning up in the yard, turning up on the... Um, um, barge and tellingly a lot of those still seem to be in their in their packing materials so they're not the kind of ammunition you'd expect to be loaded into guns ready to go they're still sitting in the hold of the ship so again it's very logical if you're imagining these weird claws coming down opening up the ship from the top down trying to get to the engines um i can't i can't say too much from my local contacts about how their investigation is going they've asked us not to say too much mm -hmm. but they have told us they haven't found evidence of the engines the condensers the boilers um which either implies they're already long gone or they didn't successfully recover them. Nice. Um, unfortunately, the, anchor, the anchors um, have turned up in the yard, um, which you'd, you'd find on the bow of the vessel, uh, the sheet hour and the, ba and the bow anchors. These are very large yeah. objects, about um, 10 tonnes in size, which shows you how capable they are of moving things. But it also suggests they haven't just targeted the centre of the ship. They may well have worked their way along. Mm. Um, one... Um, it um, uh, it just so happens uh, I've, I've got a visual aid here. Visual aid, uh, love it, Giles. <laughs> this is this is this is a this is a model of Prince of Wales. So what you've got to imagine is first of all she's lying upside down, and then the area that we're talking about that we think has been primarily affected is this area in the middle. It was it was a sort of armoured citadel where all the vital soft parts of the ship are, like the engine rooms, the boiler rooms, but also the command and control, and, and as Giles has said, the fuel tanks and the magazines. Mm. If the anchors have gone, they're up here at this end, mm. and that implies that they've ranged across perhaps rather more of the ship than the the, the evidence of the ammunition someone implies. Mm -hmm. In terms of ammunition, most of the ammunition that we've seen 
is from the uh, 4.5 inch dual purpose guns, which were again were midships, the magazines directly below them. Um, that, but there have been one or two heavy caliber 14 inch shells that have turned up, which would have been directly below the, the, the turrets at either end of the citadel bit. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it looks as though possibly quite a bit of the ship has actually been hit. So uh, I hope it might be the uh, sorry, Mark. I hope it might be the anchors, uh, but it was just a very tempting target um, mm. exposed on the outside of the bow. So maybe they were just cut off and raised rather than the bow itself was here. torn apart. But yeah. we're just we're just that, guessing. That, that that's true. And and again, um, I mean, some of the information we're, we're applying lessons that we've learned from observations by people like Ennis McCartney of the wrecks from Battle of Jutland in the North Sea, Battle of Skagrak, as the Germans call it, where. The Dutch salvers and the other salvers who hit those wrecks did go for engine room plants and propellers. And in fact, one propeller from a British battle cruiser, we think, um, ended up going via Holland to the Far East um, at, that, that, at exactly the time I was telling you about around 2010 when the when the when the price was spiked. That that certainly that was a bit of uh, information that we were passed on as a distinct possibility. Mm. And is that um, is that the uh, the manganese steel? uh it, it, it's uh it's called manganese bronze it's manganese the, it's bronze. a particular yeah it's a high, high value um metal that the ship's props are made of mm. uh, they're, they're these huge castings basically and uh, but you, you 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 smelt them and you turn them into ingots and they're completely unidentifiable to all intents and purposes so um uh as wonderful as it is to see you hiding your face um uh <laughs> <laughs> um we've done a little bit of speculation there but I, in terms of the uh the uh, the, 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 someone having spotted a, an actual uh, gun uh, turret, no, gun barrel uh, on uh, in a scrapyard, does that imply having gone all the way through, or, or could it be that, that that again it was something that was just sticking out of the wreck and was it was a piece of opportunistic salvage? The gun that uh, we've seen in the crane is a uh, a five point two inch um, a secondary weapon used mostly as an anti-aircraft mm -hmm. weapon. Our hope is that it's one of the ones from the that was mounted on the outside of the midships section of this um, of this vessel. So it would have been quite exposed. It might even have been visible uh, before work started. Okay. Um, so our hope is that it was just again uh, something that was very accessible and easy to remove. Okay. Um, when a battleship up turns upside down, the big 14-inch guns are the lowest point of the wreck, and they're probably been pressed into the seabed. Mm. We see that on the Scapa Flow wrecks, uh, which I've been lucky enough to dive. Um, they're, they're generally quite inaccessible, mm. so um, we hope that they're still s sitting firmly on the seabed and protected by whatever remains of the battleship uh, right. above it. Okay. Um, Again, speculation at this but, point until we do a survey. It, 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 it is speculation, but I think it's also <laughs> worth making the point that, and, and the other thing I would say is, well, um, we know from, for example, some of the Japanese warships that went down in the Pacific and have been surveyed that in some cases, um, basically because the turrets are on what are called barbettes that they, 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 that they can spin around on, mm -hmm. the turrets do sometimes just fall off and fall to the seabed separately. Right. So again, and and because I, uh, to my knowledge, anyway, Giles might correct me on this, that there's not been a full area survey of the wreck, just the, the primarily the hull area itself, up until now, um, that that we we don't know as much as we maybe might like about the way materials dispersed across the seabed. So you know what happened when she sank. Uh, she's last seen sort of listing on, on the side. She clearly turned over and went down. Mm -hmm. um, but what came off and so on, we just don't know. No. no and th and therefore, the other thing... And, and, so, and therefore, how accessible it is to people. You know, that, that's like that. right. Some of, some of it might just be lying there. And, 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 and uh, the, the, the grim thought, uh, and I think I have to interject here because we need to return to the human elements of this. And I, I mentioned earlier how this means a lot to and is offensive to families and survivors, is that um, on both ships, we know that a lot of the casualties were people who were trapped working in spaces of action stations below decks, and including particularly vulnerable um, were, were places like the magazines, where people are sealed in behind steel doors. Mm -hmm. And um, so if, if they're breaking into the magazines and the shell rooms and so on, the potential for encountering human remains would be quite high. And there were allegations that when the Java Sea Rex were hit, uh, human remains were spotted in the scrapyard. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we haven't seen any evidence so far that human remains have been found this time. That's actually a little bit surprising. As Andy said, we would expect human remains to be, to um, come up from the kind of 
um, spaces that have been, that have been opened. Um, it may be that they're sitting mixed in with the, um, the wreckage on, on the seabed. Mm. And so therefore, human remains that might have been quite well preserved, entombed, are now exposed and vulnerable to marine life mm. and to anything else as well. Right. Yeah. So, uh, again, this all this is all speculation. And uh, I, I guess uh, as we, we wrap up our time together today, uh, a, a question inevitably has to be, what would a, 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 a satisfactory response to this be um, from, you know, uh, from in particular our government, but maybe also local uh, governments, Malaysia, so on and so forth, uh, and also ideally, I guess, on you know, in terms of similar uh, problem sites across the world, is there uh, an ideal roadmap forward that uh, that you two and others are, are potentially uh, trying to encourage authorities to to move towards? Because again, it doesn't sound like a lot of investment is required at the front end to prevent uh, some potentially disastrous costs at the back end. But also as well, I suspect, and this is a point I made in, in our previous episode, it wouldn't hurt um, the stated goals of so-called global Britain, etc., to have a little bit more uh, of an obvious and um, visible interest in, in places where, where, for example, shipwrecks have gone down around the world. Um, yeah, what, what, what is an ideal way forward? Do, do you have a vision in that sense? either of you when the story broke national museum of the royal navy which is actually funded um as the official mu museum of the royal navy and is connected with the ministry of defense mm. uh, it issued a very strongly worded statement um in the name of the um, director professor dominic tweddle mm. um and we when we were writing the piece again we con uh, contacted the nmrn press office to get an update on, on the statement and basically what they told us was what we need, and this is a direct quote, what we need is a management strategy for underwater naval heritage so that we can better protect and commemorate these ships. Um, now, that's something that nobody in the heritage sector would disagree with. Um, it's what people have been asking for for many years. Um, the He also told us that the National Museum of the Royal Navy is pressing the MOD, the Ministry of Defence, and the UK government to institute a proper database of Royal Navy losses built uh, on the work of the Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, MAST, who Giles <laughs> works for, and he can explain what they've been doing, um, and to develop an appropriate management strategy um, based upon it. But then he did added two kickers. The National Museum of the Royal Navy does not own the wrecks and has neither the remit nor the resources to manage or police them. And then he very pointedly said to us, that is something the UK government as flag state should be doing. Mm. NMRN can only advise and assist. Um, now, that, I think, is a, a pretty clear statement that the status quo, certainly in terms of the NMRN, isn't sustainable anymore. That this this is maybe a um, an egregious unregulated salvage too far. Early days yet, we don't know how that's going to turn out. Certainly, um, the maritime archaeology world, certainly the people I've spoken to in maritime archaeology world, very much endorse what Professor Tweddle has has said that that you know we we need a a proper system to protect, monitor and protect, and study actually. Raw Navy Rex. So in that sense, does does a database enable, for example, organizations like MAST to to better do that sort of job? Is that is that is that sort of the first step on an ideal road road forward? Oh yeah, yes indeed. Um mm. so the Lost List is an initiative that we started um a good few years ago, um, just answering the who, what, why, where question. Mm. Um it, to solve a problem, you've got to know how big the problem is. Um so on the back of the UK considering joining uh, the UNESCO Convention on Underwater Culture Heritage, which we have not yet ratified, although uh, the government promises to follow it, um, we were able to prove that there's about 5,400 Royal Navy wrecks scattered throughout the world um, dating back to the 12th century. So that's the size of the problem. And um, database is freely available on our website if anyone's interested. Um, it's a bare bones look at what those ships are, um, where they're located, uh, how they sank. Um, and it's what we've offered to the museum um, to start their um, 
investigations into how they can um, protect the her heritage. So yeah, so it, it is it's a starting point. You've got to know what this was out there. And it's got to be a starting point for assessments of significance too. I think probably as a nation, we need a grown up conversation about how important shipwrecks are to us. And if they are important, which ones are most critical. So if resources are limited, which ones we need to look at first. Um, it's telling the National Museum received the bell from um, Prince Wales. Bell's a very symbolic object, very much like a figurehead on a on a on a, on a sailing warship. Yeah. And they were recovered by technical divers under license, authorised in 2002, when uh, there were first concerns that these wrecks might be targeted by souvenir hunters. They thought at the time mm. that now seems like a very forward-thinking idea. Uh, they've not been lost. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps we should consider doing something similar with other objects from wrecks that we really want to save as a nation. Uh, perhaps a 14-inch gun from a battleship, why not Prince of Wales? Um, divers have shown me on the site um, from a looting and salvage that happened in uh, 2014, one of the compartments had been opened um, in the superstructure and um, officers' chests containing their personal possessions that had been stored before the battle were spilling out onto the seabed. Right. Um, and they were very concerned that, that those would be opened and disturbed. And uh, the local divers dearly would love to raise those, conserve them, return them to the families. Mm. Uh, which we certainly would, if the money was available, think that's a, a very poignant thing to do. Right. Um, but I think because there are lots, lots of wrecks, all of them are important. But we do, so we do need to make some decisions about which ones can we need to prioritise before we, we lose them all. It, in, in in the end, it will come down to costs. You know, technical diving diving is expensive. Add to that the conservation costs and so on. You're getting even more expensive. And um, that, you know, and that's before you get into the long term, you know, long term museum display, or, or you know, and, and and so on. It's it's complicated, as the saying goes. But I think, as Giles said, I, I agree. We need that grown up conversation as archaeologists, but also as you know, members of the public. Okay, and with members of the public. Well, uh, thank you for your time today, uh, Giles. Thank you, Andy, as always. Uh, thank you, guys at home, for watching. If you have any thoughts or comments, please do comment below and we'll be sure to pass on any pertinent messages to Giles as well. Until next time, though, do take care. Bye bye.